China, 1966. Thousands march on the Square of Heavenly Peace in Beijing. China was in a state of emergency. Known as the Red Guards, fanatical youths were spreading fear and terror throughout the country. They'd been called to take part in the great proletarian cultural revolution by China's sublime leader. Mao Zedong undoubtedly bears responsibility for millions of deaths. For him, people were human material that had to be sacrificed to attain the appropriate political goals. For the man from Hunan, any means designed to achieve a successful revolution in a China shaken by civil war was legitimate. Born into a farming family in provincial China provinces, Mao Zedong rose to become the great chairman of the Chinese Communist Party. Mao Zedong became an icon and united the country to create the People's Republic of China. In the years that followed, the great leader resolutely defended the power he had acquired. The use of arms was commonplace. It was a case of life or death, and when power was involved, he was absolutely ruthless. Mao soon freed himself from dependence on Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin and adapted to the requirements of realpolitik. He opened up China to the West and paved the way for this country to become a global economic power. To achieve this, Mao accepted not only the Red Terror, but also the destruction of civil society, a trauma from which China still suffers today. A great historic leader and a great historic criminal these two sides as a leader and also as a man who did terrible harm. With a history dating back some three and a half thousand years, China is one of the oldest advanced civilizations on Earth. The size of the entire European continent, this multi-ethnic state is home to one-fifth of the world's population. For more than 2,000 years, this huge country was ruled by various imperial dynasties. Isolated from the common people, its emperors ruled China from the Forbidden City, an extensive palace complex in Beijing. Languishing in traditions and ritualized politics, the ruling caste failed to lead their country into the modern era. As with many other monarchies, around the turn of the 20th century in China too, the feudal system began to falter. The poor became more and more impoverished, while a clique of corrupt court officials filled their pockets. The colonial powers pushed their way into this backward country, and brought the Chinese economy to a standstill. Soon, huge areas were suffering from grinding poverty. In the early 20th century, famine and epidemics spread like wildfire. When I first got to China, and uh, when I was working in the United Nations Famine Relief Program, the average life expectancy was 31, 32 years. 25% of all babies born died before the end of their first year. And there was constant famine every year, constant plague, bubonic plague, uh, yellow fever, uh, typhoid, typhus, uh, cholera, everything you can think of, killed thousands and thousands of people every year. And there was banditry everywhere. The roads weren't safe. Your home wasn't safe. And unemployed, huge numbers of unemployed. Mao Zedong was born in 1893 in the province of Hunan, in the hinterland of central China. His father was a wealthy farmer. The eldest of three sons, Mao lived with his family on a remote homestead. News of the emperor's death only reached this area two years later. His father made sure that Mao enjoyed a comprehensive school education. But the young man felt no desire to become a farmer. 
Er ist auf dem Land aufgewachsen. He grew up in the countryside where he enjoyed a privileged position. He never knew hunger. His father wasn't a capitalist, but he was still a wealthy farmer. So the family never suffered. Mao had the privilege of an education, but it was what he wanted. In fact, he had to fight to overcome resistance from his parents. In the end, they removed all barriers to his education, and his father footed the bills. What Mao read politicized him. He was given books on steam engines, books on electricity, books on new things that made him wonder why his country didn't have them. Then, of course, as a student, he took part in all the discussions on colonialism, on independence, and on the founding of the First Republic. Finally, in autumn 1911, the revolution came. The five-year-old emperor, Pu Yi, was to be forced to abdicate. Mao joined the anti-imperialist forces. In January 1912, the Republic of China was founded. Pu Yi abdicated. But the young state was weak. Soon the huge empire sank into chaos once again. Mao went back to school but he totally lacked orientation with regard to his future. Mao had enjoyed training to become a teacher. Before starting his teaching seminar, he had withdrawn to a library for a few weeks and read absolutely everything he could get hold of. He also applied for a place at a wide range of colleges, from soap making to whatever, say, economics. But he was never good at languages. At those universities, he would have had to speak English, but that was beyond him. So he continued his search, and when he found the teaching seminar in Changsha, it was just right for him. At the school, there were plenty of progressive teachers with Republican ideas. Mao believed the newly founded republic was in danger. The tottering nation had come under the influence of a wide range of powers. Regional military commanders, like the colonial powers, tried to enrich themselves at the cost of this unstable country and exploited China. The new government was weak, corrupt and full of cliques. Interim, emergency and military governments ruled one after another. It was in this climate that young Mao discovered his talent for politics. He began to write his first articles. Our nation lacks strength. Military spirit has not been encouraged. The physical state of our people is deteriorating day by day. These are extremely worrying phenomena, Mao wrote in 1917. For him is entscheidend the fähigkeit The ability to write and express himself incredibly well in Chinese was of major importance to him. For the first time, he felt a kind of power that made him superior to the others. So this ability to articulate, to get to the heart of things, revealed itself at an early stage. After completing his studies to become a teacher, he wrote his first periodicals, which were very moving and highly inflammatory. They showed that he definitely possessed charismatic qualities. But Mao's politicization took place in Beijing when he worked there and began publishing his journals. That is when he focused on the real issues. In nineteen eighteen, Mao went to Beijing to study. And it was here that he met intellectuals who focused on Marxism. For the first time, he also came into contact with the trailblazing political writings which were to vastly change the 20th century. Mao selbst hat sich ja geweigert ins Ausland zu Mao refused to go abroad. Unlike many others, he never visited France or the Soviet Union. But he had spent many years training to become a teacher in Beijing and had worked in a library. For the first time, he had read theoretical writings, but only on a rudimentary basis, of course. 
Virtually nothing, it must be said, had been translated into Chinese. The works of Marx and Engels were not translated until the 1950s. Before then, only sections had appeared in translation. Educated circles in China followed developments in Russia with great interest. And China's massive neighbor was also having to deal with huge upheavals of its own. The Tsarist Empire had imploded. Its ruling dynasty had been ousted and replaced with a people's government. Through socialism to communism was the slogan Vladimir Ilyich Lenin gave the people. His declared aim was to bring about a world revolution. The Soviet state did not hesitate to export its new ideology. As early as 1920, the Russian Secret Service opened a branch in Shanghai. Based on the Soviet model, the Communist International planned to create a dictatorship of the proletariat in China too. In 1921, with generous financial and personal support from Soviet Russia, the Chinese Communist Party was established in Shanghai. Mao Zedong gave up his job as a teacher and became a professional revolutionary. He saw communism first and foremost as a vehicle for mobilizing the masses for the good of the state. They asked themselves where there was a chance for an underdeveloped country to develop a political system which meant participation. The first possibility was through communism, whereby the Soviet Union was not exactly the worst model. Originally, when the party was founded, China's communists had been an insignificantly small group. The party only gained appreciably in size over the course of its long conflict with the nationalists. To pacify the country, initially the communists joined forces with Kuomintang, the National People's Party led by Chiang Kai-shek. But when the communists began to plan Soviet republics in China, the alliance collapsed and the two parties became enemies. In August 1927, civil war broke out in China. Chiang Kai-shek savagely put down several revolts by the communists. Fighting between the two sides took place with extreme violence and claimed countless victims, especially among the civilian population. Massacres occurred in several major cities. From 57 members when it was founded, membership of the Chinese Communist Party had by now grown to 58,000. Thousands of communists were arrested. The right-wing Kuomintang soon succeeded in destroying the Communist Party's power bases in the cities. Mao, who had gone underground, now had a fighting force of 5,000 men. His aim was to get the peasants on the side of the communists. The peasants were easily the most numerous section of the Chinese population. In the years that followed, in the hinterland of South China, Mao and his units managed to win over numerous peasants and miners to their cause. The current upswing of the peasant movement, Mao wrote in 1927, is a true sensation. In every province in China, hundreds of millions of peasants will rise up as restless and fierce as a hurricane. And no power, no matter how great, will be strong enough to resist them. They will burst all their shackles and storm forth. In this early phase, it already became relatively clear that in China the emphasis would be placed on the countryside, that the peasants would play a totally different role, simply because there was no industrial proletariat of any appreciable size. So the party wanted to spread the revolution by organizing peasants and peasant associations, 
There was also a clear difference regarding the role of the superstructure, the ideology, the mass line. It was decided that ideas from the people would also be taken up, that not everything would be predefined in elitist fashion, but that there would be give and take, alternation between top and bottom. So, in the final analysis, it sounded as if there was the possibility of criticism of the party from outside. It would have been unthinkable in most of the other communist systems for the people or for various groups to exercise criticism of excesses by the bureaucracy or something similar. Those are things you would never find in the Soviet Union. Communism thus received its Chinese stamp. News of this arbitrary change of direction did not go down well in Moscow. The new Soviet General Secretary, Joseph Stalin, ruthlessly persecuted every conceivable rival within the party. Stalin sought to gain influence in China and had invested a great deal in the Chinese communists. He had hoped for a more obedient comrade than Mao Zedong appeared to be. But Mao asserted himself. He was steadily progressing towards the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. This begins. He'd already caught the attention of Moscow even in the early 1930s. The Soviets noticed the success he was having every so often in his strongholds. But Mao was only ever one player amongst several who were being built up simultaneously by Stalin and the Comintern. There were also trained cadres even in Moscow, who were also in view. In fact, there were lots of factors involved, like Mao's military and strategic achievements along with the errors of the previous party chairman. There was also his ability to adapt to this situation, to have no scruples with regard to power struggles within the party, in the final analysis to use violence also within the party. And we also have his ability to portray himself as the party's theoretician. In the late 1930s, Mao wrote a series of theoretical articles which, on the one hand, made him not only the movement's thinker, but on the other hand, also a practical revolutionary leader. In this respect, he combined Stalin and Lenin in one person. In 1931, south of the Yangtze River, Mao founded the first Chinese Soviet state. His comrades in arms saw his potential and bowed to his claim to leadership. One of his first military commanders, Chou Enlai, remained faithful to Mao throughout his entire life. Before coming to power, when he was struggling to get the peasants to support the revolution, to win power, he was the best listener that I ever heard. Marxism for him was only a tool, an instrument, to drive the Chinese revolution to success. He was not at all interested in political theory as theory. So he would make it up as he went along to meet the, what he perceived as the needs of Chinese reality. That was the thing about Mao that put him ahead of all the other Chinese leaders. Mao's closest colleagues were Chu Enlai and Zhu De. For seven years, they fought a guerrilla war against the Chinese nationalist forces of the Kuomintang. Mao was now starting to make a name for himself internationally. Mao was first mentioned by the London Times newspaper in 1929 in a report from its Shanghai correspondent. The name Chu Mao has been notorious on the borders of Fukin and Kwangtung for two years now. He has twice been driven into the mountains, but there he proved too mobile to be captured. But with the first signs of detente, he came back down and devastated the plain. Chu Mao calls himself a communist. Wherever he goes, he turns to the peasants and tells them they must destroy the capitalists and bourgeois elements. Yet he himself, the Times wrote in 1927, is the worst bandit of all. Writing later about the protracted war, Mao wrote, the army must become one with the people so that the people feel that the army is their own. Such an army will be invincible. While the two opponents in the Civil War were involved in bitter fighting in South China, Japanese troops invaded Manchuria and in 1931 proclaimed the puppet state of Manchukuo, 
Finally, in 1934, Mao's troops saw themselves encircled by the more powerful nationalist forces. Retreat was inevitable. So around 86,000 people headed west. The leadership group around Mao decided to make for Yan'an, near the Soviet-controlled border region. The men who took part in this long march were a motley crew. When you look at the leadership groups, you find a fair number of once privileged figures, wealthy farmers or at least landowners. But the troops they led were a wild assembly of former bandits, mercenaries and soldiers, but also idealistic young men and women, more and more of whom had joined the party from the towns and cities. Originally, though, the leadership had grabbed all the fighters it could. The Long March became Mao's strategic masterpiece. In contrast to what propaganda has since claimed, it was primarily an escape towards the northwest. The retreat, through more than 10,000 kilometers of almost impassable terrain, took a whole year, during which time Mao finally succeeded in gaining acceptance as the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. At this point, Mao Zedong did not play any kind of superior role. During the flight, however, the military errors committed by the commanders at the time forced Mao into a leading role. But the whole enterprise was a major disaster. It was a long flight movement. Of the 86,000 in the front, which also included Mao, losses were so high that only 8,000 survived. However, thanks to Mao himself, a legend was created that a group of resolute fighters, mainly men, because only a handful of women took part in the long march, would succeed in defying all resistance in order to build a new and glorious future for China. The communists set up their headquarters in the remote upland plain in Yan'an. Despite the enormous losses they had suffered, it was here that Mao Zedong became the role model for an entire generation. One of his attributes was that he could give people goals, and he was a master at getting to the heart of an issue. That's what we are fighting for. That is our goal. Even redefining the long march as a victory shows great skill. Time and again in Yan'an, Mao received national and international photographers and journalists and presented himself as a showcase communist. Es gab in Yan'an die ersten Anzeichen eines Personenkultes. Das wurde von in Yan'an, the first signs of a personality cult became evident. It was promoted by others, but Mao also played along. He was ideal for the role. First of all, he spoke excellent Chinese. He could get straight to the heart of an issue. He also had this charisma, especially in Yan'an where he taught and led. Perhaps it had to do with his origins, or perhaps the fact that he had never been abroad that he still symbolized both the Chinese peasant and the intellectual. He embodied everything. He was just right for the role. Mao worked hard at his image by specifically inviting various Western journalists to portray him. Young American Sidney Rittenberg who came to China in 1944, was fascinated by Mao's aura. He had an aura. He attracted people because of the aura of being the leader. But the main attraction was the, the power of his mind, his ability to analyze 
and to uh, formulate. He could formulate very complex political issues in very simple popular language. Mao succeeded in winning over the rural population with cautious reforms. For the first time, portraits of Mao were soon to be seen on the walls of houses in the villages and on public buildings. Schools were named after him. Yan'an became a place of pilgrimage. The base in the barren upland valley grew constantly. Amongst other things, the comrades managed to survive economically because of their extensive opium poppy fields, which guaranteed around 40% of their income. Very few of the party members knew anything about communism. Two-thirds were illiterate. Mao's educational concept bound them to him and the party politically and socially. Later, the time in Yan'an was glorified as the communist model era. Es schien und es war wahrscheinlich anfangs auch in Teilen ein anderer Lebensentwurf. It seemed like a different life. And in certain ways, at first it was different from what was possible in the towns where the Kuanmintang held sway. A modern democratic China really seemed to be emerging as a microcosm. And that was attractive. This suddenly gave many the chance to express themselves, perhaps to restore a certain form of literature, to live this equality between men and women. That made it attractive. The fact that people also began informing on one another and that restrictive political issues were suddenly introduced is another story. They said that could be freedom, that could be a new China. But as propaganda, it certainly achieved something. Das könnte ein neues China werden. Insofern hat es als Propaganda durchaus was bewirkt. In this communist enclave, many experienced democratic participation for the first time. Even the more educated on the long march received ideological education and were urged to do physical work. At the same time, however, Mao also initiated the first purges in the party to free it from spies and bad elements. Those who confessed, sometimes under torture, were given the chance to improve. Mao also had critical remarks and writings persecuted. Yet his appeal remained undiminished. Young idealists flocked to Yan'an from all over the country. People like Zhang Qing, a 23-year-old actress from Shanghai. She went to Yan'an as a convinced communist. These are old photos, but you can see how attractive she was. She was an actress whose moral conduct was, for the first time, very loose. The party leadership was not at all happy to see Mao in a relationship with this woman. But he followed a straight line. It could really have harmed him in those days. But all he said was, I'm going to do it. I'm going to marry her. They had a daughter together. He put his head way above the parapet. But politically, she backed him to the hilt. She was a highly emancipated and very resolute woman. In 1939, Mao married Zhang Jing, who, in return, had to promise not to engage in politics in public. Mao's fourth wife was not daunted by rumors of his constant womanizing. I know that some of the reports on his womanizing were grossly exaggerated, but he all, apparently he always had a mistress, at least one. But the only woman I ever saw him with, except at dances, was Jiang Qing, his wife. You know, I never saw any real warmth between the two of them, but he was an aloof person. Like with Zhou Enlai and his wife, or Trudeau and his wife, they were very warm. But Mao, I never saw Mao very warm towards anybody. Zhang Qing remained devoted to Mao for the rest of her life. Just like Zhou Enlai and Zhu Di, with whom Mao worked on his war strategy against the Kuomintang. Because away from the upland plain 
the Chinese Civil War was still raging. Everyone who joined Mao's forces received basic military training. Besides being taught how to handle weapons, they were also given lessons in tactics. The little formula on how to fight guerrilla warfare, he made up from his experience on the way up the mountain because at the beginning of the experience, they lost battles, they were defeated. And then he figured out what is the way to fight so we can win. And he made up these 16 characters in Chinese, which rhyme. And they made a nice little rhyme that any country boy could recite. Very simple. The enemy advances, we retreat. Enemy camps, we harass. Enemy tires, we attack. Enemy retreats, we pursue. Very simple. The Red Army grew steadily. The Revolutionary War is a war of the masses, Mao said. It can only be waged by mobilizing the masses and by trusting in the masses. In fighting the Kuomintang, army commanders learnt vital lessons, which Mao concisely summarized. No question, never gamble, never fight unless you outnumber the enemy forces by at least three or four times, even better, nine or ten times. And never fight when you can't win quickly before he has a chance to move up tanks and planes and so on. Otherwise, don't fight. Red Army recruits were mainly rural workers and small farmers, and many were extremely young. They weren't always armed. Often they weren't even wearing shoes or straw sandals. This is how the German communist magazine AIZ described their appearance in 1933. Young Red China appears. Drums are heard in the mountains. They are canvassing for the Red Army. The cadres of the young Red Guards are growing. They are nearly all still children. They are marching barefoot against the imperialist robbers, fighting with lances and scythes against the machine guns of the Kuomintang army. Besides Mao, it was mainly the two commanders, Chou Enlai and Zhu De, who made a name for themselves. In 1937, the harrowing civil war had already lasted for more than 10 years. By now, the Red Army consisted almost entirely of infantry. Contrary to what the propaganda claimed, time and again people deserted. But here too, Mao's ideological pragmatism shone through. The fascinating thing was how he would learn from his own mistakes and change his way of working. For example, at first, Anyone who deserted from the Revolutionary Army, if they were caught, they were shot in front of the other troops to teach them a lesson. But life was hard, men were hungry, they were tired, the enemy was in hot pursuit, and more and more deserted. So he changed the policy entirely. And he gathered all the troops together and announced, from now on, if you want to go, go. As long as you don't take your rifle, the rifle was revolutionary property. That was done, so fewer people deserted. They knew they could go any time. And he continued that policy right through to the end of the war. But the war suddenly took a surprising twist. Japan began to invade the whole of China. The aggressors planned to subjugate all of Asia. In December 1938, Japanese troops carried out a massacre in Nanking, which claimed around 300,000 lives. Mao's and Chiang Kai-shek's two hostile camps joined forces to repel the invaders. Together, they managed to keep the Japanese in check on the common front. The occupying Japanese forces committed numerous other war crimes, which in the end prompted the United States to impose sanctions. 
when Japanese bombers then attacked the US Pacific base at Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the regional conflict had become a world war. In China, the invaders continued to occupy the east of the country. Millions were fleeing. Finally, it was foreign forces who put an end to the war. On August 6, 1945, at Hiroshima in Japan, the United States deployed a weapon of staggering destructive force. Three days later, a second atom bomb was dropped over Nagasaki, claiming 100,000 lives. On September 2, 1945, Japan surrendered unconditionally. Chiang Kai-shek saw himself as the victor. The Americans gave the Generalissimo generous financial and military support because they wanted to establish China as a buffer zone between their area of interest in the Pacific and that of the Soviet Union. The start of the Cold War was having an initial effect in East Asia too. But for well over a year, Mao had also been in contact with American negotiators. In summer 1944, he had welcomed US officers he had had specially flown into Yan'an as our friends. He saw the visit by an American delegation as a gain in prestige. But the main purpose of the Dixie mission, as it was called, was to reconcile the Chinese Communist Party with the Kuomintang in order to stabilize the country. The US had no interest in a communist victory. At the end of 1945, Mao traveled to Chongqing for negotiations. I think it's one of the tragedies of history that Mao several times tried to get help from the United States to bolster him against Stalin and, and we turned him down. In 1946, I twice translated messages from Mao same message. After, in five years, we expect to be in power over all of China. And when that happens, we want normal relations with the United States for two reasons. First, because after World War II, you're the only country that has the money to give us construction loans. Two, we do not want to be unilaterally dependent on the Soviet Union. Because while there are comrades in many basic viewpoints, we do not share that viewpoint. So we like to be able to deal with both worlds. And we turn him down. We slam the door in his face. The US government sympathized with the Chinese nationalists and wanted to stabilize Chiang Kai-shek's regime. A final American attempt at mediation actually led to a ceasefire. On Mao's behalf, in the presence of George C. Marshall, who later became U.S. Defense Secretary, Chou Enlai signed the document. It was planned to establish a coalition government comprised of various parties. But shortly afterwards, the two arch enemies broke their alliance. In autumn 1948, Mao planned his decisive campaign against the Kuomintang. The war between Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese Communists was close to being decided. 300 kilometers north of Nanking, nearly 600,000 Chinese national troops were surrounded. Fierce fighting was taking place on all fronts. The civil war took a fateful twist for the Kuomintang. Many of its troops defected to the Communists. The leadership of the right-wing Kuomintang was regarded as corrupt and unscrupulous. A million soldiers had already surrendered. The spoils of war taken from the government troops included heavy machine guns from Russia and weapons from Czechoslovakia. New defence plans were being discussed and new measures sought in order to avert the impending danger at the last moment. The new tactic employed by the People's Liberation Army, as the Red Army now called itself, was to reconquer China's major cities. 
In order to win through, like here in Shanghai, the nationalists were absolutely ruthless. Anyone who was even suspected of being a communist was summarily executed. In spring 1949, the imperial city of Beijing fell to the communists. People's Liberation Army troops then headed south and registered one success after another. Many foreign nationals left the country in panic. Army commander Lin Biao had already taken the whole of Manchuria. By now, the People's Liberation Army consisted of more than a million battle-tested soldiers, and it also had heavy weapons. The Kuomintang forces, however, had been virtually wiped out. Shanghai was one of the last cities to be conquered by Mao's army. The success of the communist troops in the civil war, which only became a certainty from mid-1947, can certainly not be attributed to one single reason. The fact that the communist troops took a far more civil approach to the populace played a role. So did the fact that they were a more unified body, and that they succeeded in developing a vision of the future which many more people shared. But it also had to do with the resoluteness of the two parties. With Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, there were many groups within the party, and this led to several conflicts. By comparison, since the 1940s at the latest, the Communist Party presented an extremely closed and united front behind Mao. So it had no frictional losses in the sense of leadership conflicts. In the final analysis, this war was also decided to a large extent through concrete errors on the battleground. Strategic misjudgments took place. Consequently, in many battles, the decisions taken by the communists were simply better. Chiang Kai-shek was beaten. In the meantime, the Generalissimo had retreated to the island of Taiwan and set up a new headquarters. The Republic of China, he proclaimed, still exists today. Millions of Kuomintang soldiers were taken prisoner. The Chinese Civil War claimed at least a million lives. The glorious entry of the People's Liberation Army into Beijing, staged in perfect propaganda style. Mao Zedong had finally won the battle for China. But it would still take a few years before all areas of this huge country were under communist control. Mao had achieved his goal. Beijing, the seat of the Emperor of China for thousands of years, was to be his new capital. Standing in a captured US jeep on March the 25th, 1949, the victorious revolutionary leader entered Beijing. Six months later, virtually the whole of China had been conquered. On October the 1st, 1949, Mao Zedong made his way to the Gate of Heavenly Peace. His portrait was already hanging over the main entrance to the Forbidden City in Beijing, once the palace complex of the Chinese Emperor. Mao's task now was to proclaim the People's Republic of China. It was 10 o'clock in the morning on a clear but chilly day in autumn. Around 100,000 people witnessed the historic moment. He said that today the People's Republic of China is born. But what he never said, nor is it written down anywhere, is what he actually felt at that moment. What was going through his head? We have no idea. What impact had all those victims had on him? For decades he had been surrounded by people fighting and dying, by people who were starving. How do you handle that? <laughs> 
You must be able to shut your mind to so much, and it must make you very hard and ruthless. From now on, one-fifth of mankind lived under Mao's rule. In 1949, when they first set up the People's Republic, Mao Zedong said lots of things that have been forgotten. But one line he said was not forgotten. He said, today we Chinese have stood up. We will never again be humiliated and bullied by the great powers. We take our place as an equal in the family of nations. That was powerful because Chinese have been humiliated for over a century. And now their national pride was back. And all this was connected with Mao and the Communist Party. Two months later, Mao headed west. First, he was received in Moscow by Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov. On his first visit abroad, the great chairman expressed his hope for close cooperation. During the Cold War, Mao took the side of the Big Brother state and evoked the friendship between the two nations. The great chairman expressly thanked Comrade Stalin for his support for the revolution. The Soviet Union was the first country to acknowledge the People's Republic of China, and it did so the very next day after it was proclaimed by Mao Zedong. Thanks to Mao, Stalin could now regard the world's most populous country as part of his sphere of influence. But in return, the Soviet leader expected gratitude for his years of support. The city of world revolution, Stalin stated, was still Moscow. At the official state banquet, the comrade from Beijing was allowed to congratulate the Soviet dictator on his 70th birthday. At the same time, however, he was put in his place. Mao had to wait for weeks before he could sign the planned friendship agreement. It was not until February 1950 that China's new premier and foreign minister Chou Enlai was able to sign the extensive cooperation agreements. The atmosphere between the two communist dictators, both of whom were present, could not have been frostier. Stalin saw Mao as a rival of equal stature because Mao wanted China to become a world power. In the meantime, another communist autocrat benefited from the situation. In North Korea, Kim Il-sung, who had been installed by Joseph Stalin, had decided to take control of the other half of the divided country. But he needed support if he was to attack South Korea, which was protected by the United Nations. Kim Il-sung skillfully played the two red dictators off against each other. Basically, he conned each side into believing that its leader stood behind him. So an appropriate agreement now had to be quickly reached. In this way, Kim Il-sung managed to push ahead with his own interest in the two Korean states being unified. Mao was far more interested in capturing Taiwan. So a Korean war didn't really suit him. Nevertheless, when the decision was taken, so-called volunteer units were dispatched. But these units were comprised not only of volunteers, but, to a certain extent, also of demobilized troops. We shouldn't forget that fighting in China continued into the early 50s. So former enemies and bandits, as they were called from southern China, were conscripted to fight in the Korean War instead of being sent to a labor camp. On June the 25th, 1950, the North Korean People's Army crossed the border separating the two halves of the divided peninsula. For three years, the front shifted from one end of Korea to the other. The population suffered tremendous losses. The fighting cost the lives of three million civilians. Three years later, Korea was a wasteland and is still a divided country today. 
400,000 Chinese troops were killed in this war. They were sent to the slaughter as human waves. Unit after unit had to advance until the enemy ran out of ammunition. Mao's eldest son, An Ying, was among those who fell. Mao disregarded the losses as insignificant. The fact that his forces had been able to repel American troops was a huge gain in prestige for his regime. At the same time, the Communist Party introduced the reforms it had fought for during the Civil War. Landowners were dispossessed and their land was redistributed. But the measures were to be carried out not by the organs of state, but by the villagers themselves, who were also expected to play an active role in building up the new revolutionary order. But the land reform soon assumed radical aspects. In the first five years, they carried out all sorts of social reforms. Plus, the people targeted as counter-revolutionaries were suppressed, shot or imprisoned or in labor farm. But for the rest of the people, it was great freedom that they'd never seen before. The show trials which the visitors staged against local landowners were initiated and monitored by work teams from the party. Over the next three years, around a million landowners and their families fell victim to the terror. Mao welcomed the violence. In the class struggle, he said, certain classes emerge victorious while others are destroyed. That is the course of history. It has been the story of civilization for thousands of years, Mao wrote. His means for unifying China were nationalism, terror and ideology. As a rule, Mao used violence as a political instrument to achieve mobilization as well as political goals. In the early 50s in particular, during the Korean War, he launched an important campaign, suppression of the counter-revolution, as it was known. To attain an appropriately high degree of mobilization, he set percentage quotas for executions in the various regions. And here too, various regions really wanted to stand out and increase their quotas. This is certainly one of the facts why Mao Zedong can be made directly responsible for executions and similar crimes. Within six months, more than 700,000 people were executed. At least one and a half million Chinese disappeared in labor camps. The strategy of terror as an instrument of power for the Communist Party wasn't all that Mao's regime imported from the Soviet Union. Moscow also provided the funds for rebuilding China economically. Under the slogan, Learn from the Soviet Union, the Great Brother also gave its Chinese comrades training in industry and agriculture. The first Chinese tractor factory did not begin production until 1958. Mao was the great helmsman who was to guide the young nation through the dangerous waters of reconstruction. His word was law, he had critics removed. Mao adopted an autocratic style of government right from the start. Very few dared to contradict him. They looked at him as the person who knew what to do. The, the slogan you kept hearing over and over was, when we follow Chairman Mao's instructions, we win. When we don't follow them, we lose. Looking back at their past history, we won the war because we applied Mao's strategy and tactics. And now we'll build the country the same way. In summer 1953, at the end of the Korean War, the Chinese leadership presented the first five-year plan in line with the Soviet model. Prisoners from the penal camps were also required to perform forced labor for reconstruction. In addition, step by step, the private economy was to be nationalized, along with Chinese agriculture. Gradually, the land and the means of production in each village were to be nationalized. Mao demanded diligence and contentment.
every official, indeed the entire nation, must constantly remember that China is a great socialist country, yet at the same time, economically, it is a poor, backward country. That is a huge contradiction, and several decades of hard work will be needed, the great chairman wrote, to make our country rich and powerful. He reckoned it would take between 15 and 18 years to build up a socialist economy. Socialist progress was recorded in propaganda style. By the late 1950s, China had developed well. Economically, progress was being made. In the early days of the People's Republic, average life expectancy was 36. But by the late 50s, it had already risen to 50 or 60. People no longer starved. Although the level was still poor, life for everyone was steadily improving. The party pushed ahead with all speed in indoctrinating the masses. Meetings and courses took place in all areas of life. The Mao Zedong path was propagated as the model for the successful emancipation of all colonial and semi-colonial countries. Mao seen reviewing a military parade on the Square of Heavenly Peace. By now, the People's Liberation Army was well equipped. It also had a navy and an air force. Along with the Chinese Communist Party and the state apparatus, it was now one of the three pillars of the Chinese state and Mao Zedong was its undisputed ruler. The obligatory propaganda posters of his subjects still showed Mao side by side with Comrade Stalin. But in March 1953, the Stalinist era came to an end. After suffering a stroke, Joseph Stalin died. Mao offered his condolences but he did not travel to Moscow for the funeral. For him, the dictator's death was a moment of liberation. However, relations with the new Soviet leadership proved even more difficult than those with the vindictive Stalin. Mao emphatically rejected Khrushchev's comprehensive criticism of Stalin. Nor was the great chairman prepared to bow to Stalin's claim to leadership of the socialist bloc. Mao was no longer willing to be seen as the little brother. A rift threatened to divide the socialist world. He used to say, in Chinese, I, re I have neither heaven nor law. As far as nothing can stop me, nothing can control me. But, um, I didn't realize how seriously he meant that. At the Communist Party's eighth annual conference, Mao once again stressed the principle of collective leadership and called for abuses to be criticized in public. Yet only a year later, he had critical scientists and intellectuals ruthlessly persecuted. The prisons and labor camps filled up. In autumn 1957, the Red Dictator proclaimed a new economic campaign the great leap forward. He changed 180 degrees. His mind became full of fantasy, you know, and he dreamed impossible dreams. And he launched these uh, huge programs of social reform, like first the great leap forward, which changed the lives of literally hundreds of millions of people, peasants, farm people, when he knew himself that he did not know what the results were going to be. One of the first and at the same time most bizarre campaigns which the great chairman ordered as part of the Great Leap Forward concerned China's sparrows, which were allegedly devouring too much grain. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese from five-year-old to the elderly were mobilized to get the plague under control and thus save tons and tons of grain. Two billion sparrows were killed in China, with unforeseeable consequences 
and in extremely unorthodox ways. Dann hat man mit Trommeln und Lärm haben Millionen von Leuten so viel Lärm. Millions of people made so much noise with drums and in other ways that the sparrows couldn't land or feed. They just fell exhausted from the sky. It was like some apocalyptic vision. But of course they no longer ate pests. So we're talking about cycles which no one understood. The other factors that people were now easy to mobilize. It was a skill Mao and his party, the way they were organized, had from top to bottom. But the consequences of the Sparrow Massacre assumed dimensions which could no longer be assessed. And that had a huge impact. In der Konsequenz plötzlich Dimension aus, was wo man überhaupt nicht überblickt hatte, was hat das im Ganzen für Auswirkungen. Insects and pests multiplied out of hand. To combat them, China had to import sparrows from the Soviet Union. But the Great Leap Forward campaign was aimed primarily at the peasants. They were to make China one of the richest and most progressive countries on Earth. The main function of the Great Leap Forward was for Mao to overcome the inequality between urban and rural development. And that was the basis of the idea that if the peasants could not be brought to industry, industry could be taken to the countryside, clusters could be formed, and in this way agriculture and rural areas industrialized. It was his attempt to stop this unequal development and also to counteract the abatement of revolutionary fervor. Mao was very critical about the growing institutionalization and bureaucratization of the power structure. He had seen the danger of capitalist, as he called them, or revisionist features reappearing. So he wanted to keep the revolution going on a permanent basis. Through large-scale operations like the Great Leap Forward, public enthusiasm seemed promotable. And, at the same time, support for the rural population could also be provided. 90 million Chinese became steelworkers. Mao had primitive furnaces built in every village. Peasants left their fields to fetch coal, hammer ore, or to sort scrap. Old tools and cooking utensils were melted down. I worked on a backyard steel furnace my wife worked on another steel furnace. You know, it was pots and fence, iron fences and so on. It was cooked down and we raked out the so-called steel. It looked like black mud. And I asked the person in charge, is this really steel? And he said, oh yeah, we send it to the big steel plants and they, they know what to do. Actually, it was all nonsense, it was all wasted. The campaign laid down certain yield quotas for the provinces that had to be attained. On the basis of these quotas, the proportion of the overall grain yield which China could export was determined. The peasants had to hand over their harvest at low fixed prices. A kind of competition developed between the various provinces or between the regional party secretaries who tried to outdo one another with reports on their excellent production figures. That's why in every movement there are some activists who try to stand out and put more moderate figures in a poorer light. That's also why in the party press one top report follows the next. But those who only figure in a fraction of the reports, the grain yield reports for instance, are thus under enormous pressure to justify themselves. Suddenly they even find themselves seen as class enemies. And that's how the spiral comes into being of totally fictional reports being passed on. Because of quotas that were set far too high, villages were forced to surrender what they needed to survive. Agriculture collapsed. Winter 1958 saw the start of the Great Famine. China experienced the worst hunger disaster in human history. Up to 40 million died. The big question this raises is, how much did the party leadership know and how much did Mao himself know about the true state of things in the countryside? Here it can be said that China has always had two forms of public knowledge, and it still has today. There is the party press, which never reports on anything bad or negative. 
Then there is an internal sphere where, for example, newspaper correspondents have assumed a kind of information duty. Or it might be party secretaries who have passed on their appropriate observations to the party leadership via all possible channels. You can also see that even during the Great Leap Forward, reports of famine in certain regions were passed on. It's not that the party leadership had no idea of such effects in specific regions. It's just that from a certain point in time, this was accepted. And although Mao was informed about the errors that had been made, in the final analysis, he decided to make an example and give the Great Leap Forward yet another thrust, which then led to millions of deaths. Natural disasters made the situation even worse. Famine in the north and serious flooding in the south of China destroyed the harvests. To escape the hunger, thousands fled to the British colonies of Macau and Hong Kong, where soup kitchens had been set up. At first, however, the world public learnt nothing of the true dimensions of the catastrophe. Huge quantities of wheat were imported into China from Australia and Canada. But the United States had imposed a trade embargo. From 1961 through to the 1970s, China had to import more than 6 million tons of wheat every year. The great helmsman ignored the horrific reports. The great leap forward was turning into a disaster of apocalyptic proportions. At the same time, like here on the border with Hong Kong, foodstuffs from China continued to be exported to neighboring countries in order to secure the foreign exchange needed to pay for the enforced industrialization of China. Four million Chinese had already left the country. Anyone who was able to sent food parcels to families or friends on the Chinese mainland. In the People's Republic, Post office workers delivered more than 50,000 parcels every day. Shelves in stores in Hong Kong were filled with foodstuffs from China. But on the other side of the border, people were starving. Following massive criticism of his mismanagement, in 1959, Mao had to step down and hand over the office of president to Liu Shaoqi. Step by step, the requirements of the Great Leap Forward were repealed. But despite his official resignation, Mao had no intention of giving up his power as the great chairman. Very soon, he began to sabotage his successor Liu. Meanwhile, China had successfully established itself as a major power. Finally, in 1964, the People's Republic also became a nuclear power. The first successful atomic test on Chinese soil took place at the experimental site in the Lop Nor Desert in the northwest of the country. When the People's Republic was founded on October 1, 1949, a new world power had emerged. And the Chinese resolutely added that if they were a world power, they also wanted an atom bomb. After the long conflict with Japan, and also with the Americans, plus its separation from the Soviet Union, China was a nation at last. And as Mao indeed said, we are a nation which will never again be humiliated. After the Soviet Union had refused to help China develop nuclear weapons, the People's Republic distanced itself more and more from its great brother and Russia's new leadership, under Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin. An ice age began between China and Russia. When Mao took a closer look at Soviet policy in the 1960s, he saw it by and large as a departure from the original ideals. The class struggle was being played down and a kind of peaceful competition between systems was being postulated. The idea that capitalism could be overcome in a peaceful way. By and large, Mao feared an end of the revolution and the implanting of bureaucratic, elitist mindsets within the party. This was something he had always tried to destabilize through mass campaigns. Now he sought out the cultural sector because basically it's the most open from an interpretational aspect. All kinds of things can be read into it. 
From late 1965, he used this weapon for his first open attacks on those he suspected of wanting to support revisionist efforts in China. Mao looked for his new alliance partners outside the Soviet Union. In isolated Albania, he thought he had found a reliable ally against his Russian rival. When Albanian Prime Minister Mehmet Shehu visited Beijing in June 1966, Mao had already concluded his plans for a return to unlimited power in China. Now he wanted to implement those plans. In July 1966, Mao reported back on the world stage with a massive publicity coup. To mark a swimming event across the Yangtze, China's biggest river, the 72-year-old went into the water himself. The idol of the People's Republic was preparing for his final campaign, the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. The man was a master showman. Nobody's sure what's going to happen. Where is Mao? He disappeared for about six months. Not heard from, seen. The American press was reporting he's probably dead and they don't want to announce it or very sick. And all of a sudden, he appears on the front pages of every newspaper, looking like life eternal. In his bathing suit with a towel, he'd just flown the Yangtze, his hand up saying hi to everybody. Hey folks, I'm here, and I'm in good shape, and I'm in charge. And then immediately, he came back to Beijing and took charge. Mao utilized the high esteem in which he was still held thanks to propaganda. Under the guise of staging an ideological line battle, he was planning a coup from the top. On July the 18th, the great chairman arrived unannounced at party headquarters in Beijing and let the great chaos begin. Then he comes back to Beijing. He has a meeting of the political bureau in which he says, in our constitution it's written, people have the right, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of organization, and so on. He says all the socialist countries have this written in their constitution. Not one of them has ever carried it out. Don't you think it's time we carried it out? And for the first time, the contents of this meeting were leaked out to the people all over the place. So that was all they needed, really. He's back and he's overturning the whole show. He's bringing us freedom. On wall newspapers, Mao announced everywhere that teachers and education politicians in particular were spreading bourgeois ideas. These wall newspapers at Beijing University called on students to combat these counter-revolutionary revisionists. On every street corner, flyers were distributed or slogans of Mao hung up. At bookshops in the university quarter, works by the great chairman sold like hotcakes. Rebellion is justified, he told the country's youth. Mao's stipulations were to replace the traditional code of values which had previously characterized Chinese society. Initially, the Cultural Revolution was directed predominantly at the educational sector, at a reform of the school system and university teaching. It was in late 1966 that the first groups formed, more or less spontaneously. They called themselves the Red Guard. Then it was mainly the great mass movements of August 1966, which ensured that everything became a national phenomenon, emanating from Beijing. School children and students nationwide joined forces and, in line with the tone of the time, formed units to destroy four old elements – old thinking, old culture, old morals and old customs. This found particular expression in Red August when, in various ways, so-called class enemies, be they teachers, children or the descendants of former class enemies, were then physically attacked and also beaten to death. At battle sittings, as they were known, professors and party cadres were insulted and mistreated. Some had to wear pointed hats of shame. The Red Guards roamed the city 
looking specifically for delinquents named as such by Mao's staff. Soon the entire country was in the grip of his hysteria. The fanatical gangs didn't even stop at torture or manslaughter. Many people felt terrified. For example, I remember a high school teacher. There came a knock on the door one night and he opened the door and two of his students stabbed him to death. Right there. And there. So things like that happened. It was a time of terror. And the Red Guards called it Red Terror. They would uh, form a circle around a, an official and threaten him. And if he was frightened, they would say that he's not a real revolutionary. He should not be afraid of the masses. If he wasn't frightened, they'd say, this, this guy's OK. In fact, that was one of the tests they used to see whether officials, party officials, were real revolutionaries or not. Anyone the Red Guards found to be unsuitable was lucky to escape with their lives. Many of the cadres who were removed from office were sent into the countryside to do labor service. The terror even drove some to commit suicide. All over China, police officials were ordered not to interfere with the young Red Guards as they went about their brutal business. Red August was undoubtedly the phase when the terror had its greatest effect on the public because that was when the social hierarchies were toppled. Schoolgirls simply kicked and beat a headmistress to death. Things like that, which were previously unthinkable, have ensured that they have an effect even today. But the majority of victims of the Cultural Revolution only occurred in the period from 1968 to 1970. And by then it was no longer a case of spontaneous violence by Red Guards, nor was it the result of conflicts between rebel organizations. Once again, it was mainly state campaigns designed to screen out and execute enemies. In Harbin, in Manchuria, in northern China, press photographer Li Zhencheng saw how a crowd of spectators was assembled outside the city to witness the public execution of alleged counter-revolutionaries. No one intervened. In China, politics and interests were always brutally implemented very quickly. After all, that was one of the hallmarks of this society. China has a long tradition of engaging in conflicts through violence. It's a very brutal country, perhaps because of the experience that a human being is worthless. That's just the way it is. You die. You starve to death. You're washed away. You're killed in a political struggle. Es ist eben so. Man stirbt, man verhungert, man wird weggespült, man wird in politischen Kämpfen getötet. The Cultural Revolution is an important experience for human history. How do people behave? when all the restrictions are off? How do, how do different kinds of people behave when the police don't interfere and the army doesn't interfere and you can do whatever you want? Within the space of a few weeks, in Beijing alone, the Red Guards stormed more than 30,000 apartments, plundered and destroyed stores and possessions of all kinds. Residents and shop owners were often killed. Millions of Chinese destroyed their own books, paintings and other works of art out of fear of making themselves look suspicious if they didn't. Even the city streets were renamed. The new address of the Soviet embassy, for instance, was Anti-Revisionist Street. Mao approved of such moves as being essential to the revolution. He had formulated it into a theory that without destruction, there can be no construction. So if you want to build a really new society, first let them break everything down, destroy everything, overthrow everybody. And then they will begin to put things back together again. <laughs> 
two-thirds of all historical monuments were destroyed. In the Summer Palace in northern Beijing, the Red Guards hurled sculptures from their bases and painted over historic murals. These were replaced with pictures of Mao, Mao slogans or propaganda posters. Showing foresight, however, their great chairman had the Forbidden City sealed off in order to protect the Imperial Palace complex from their random vandalism. In its destructive rage, the mob was driven not only by political fanaticism, but also by the satisfaction of carrying out totally personal revenge. Had there not been any major social conflicts, this social dynamism could never have developed. But since only enemies were defined, and even then only vaguely, and since people were not given any really positive vision of a cultural revolution, various social groups were able to identify their problems in some form or other and try to implement improvements. It was therefore especially important for the children of the so-called class enemies to possibly have better access to universities, for applicants to be chosen no longer on just their social background, but also on performance. Those who had been regarded as class enemies now tried to stand out through particular loyalty to the party line and hoped for rehabilitation. The terror destroyed all forms of social solidarity. Children denounced their parents. Neighbors betrayed one another. Friends handed one another in. Decades of indoctrination were having an effect. Mao had had Chinese youth educated in accordance with his wishes. Parents are the loveliest people in the world, but no one can compare with Chairman Mao, was a typical slogan. Even young children were trained with toy guns. Indoctrination of the people reached a new height. The words of the great Chairman Mao were everywhere, on rickshaws, on buses, even on bicycles. For easier use, something else also became part of the revolutionary routine of every Chinese. The Little Red Book, also known as the Mao Bible, presented Maoism in handy pocket format. There was this small collection of sayings by Mao, relatively simple sentences which were intended to show the essence of Mao Zedong's thoughts. They were arranged according to certain themes, army, people, youth, in order to introduce ordinary soldiers to Mao Zedong's thoughts, and probably also to teach them Chinese. You must remember that at this time, too, education of the people was really kick-started. Among the students in the Red Guards, the Little Red Book quickly became a cult object. It was actually a product that wasn't thought up by Mao himself. It came about through chance and as a result of this political climate of ritualization of the study of Mao's writings. It had happened more or less accidentally, but it fitted in well with the time. In early 1966, the book was still banned. You couldn't buy one anywhere. So it was a product the young wanted because it was hard to get hold of. It also had a revolutionary style to it with this nice red cover in its handy format. It wasn't until the second half of 1966, in fact, that the book could be obtained in any form at all. Soon, there was a copy of this Catechism of the 700 Million in every household. Here, too, the traditional social roles were reversed. Children instructed their parents in the meaning and importance of the revolutionary writings. They would organize study campaigns at which people would read selections from his works. That was really the main, the main way. Under the, under the party's guidance, every factory, every government organization, every uh, farm co-op would have study sessions where they studied extracts from his work. That, was, I think, was the main source of influence. The Mao cult began to take on the appearance of a religious ritual. The words of Chairman Mao Zedong were learnt off by heart. <laughs> 
At the start and end of each working day, workers bowed to a picture of the great chairman with the honorary title of the Red Sun. Even business letters began with quotes from Mao. Maoism permeated every level of society. Mao's messianic doctrine was to be spread to even the most remote province. Here, a group of young Red Guards are on their way to a remote village. They struggle to carry the equipment they've brought with them. The villagers welcome the arrival of the young Red Guards because news rarely reaches this part of the world. What the group have brought is a mobile cinema. Then, almost as if he were present in person, Mao Zedong, the great chairman of the People's Republic of China, flickers across the screen. This is how many villagers saw their head of state for the first time. Using different means and approaches, partly through direct contact, but also partly through radio and TV reports, Mao had tried to generate the broadest possible effect of such events so as to disseminate the goals of the Cultural Revolution throughout the nation. He was quoted as having said that during Lenin's lifetime too few people had actually seen the Russian leader and that, as a result, revolutionary elan had cooled too quickly. So Mao tried once again to present himself as a revolutionary icon, to stir up the young revolution and ultimately to use the leadership cult as a kind of charismatic mobilization against the party itself. In other words, no longer primarily via the youth league or state media, but through this direct movement and a form of leader-allegiance relationship, basically to energize the revolution. Mao decreed that every Chinese ought to visit Beijing once in their lifetime. On the anniversary of the founding of the Republic on October the 1st, 1966, he had millions of young people from all over the country come to Beijing. Travel was free. Many of the youngsters had never even left their local region before. In the midst of these intimidatory masses, the obligatory Mao Bible gave them security. Dieses rote Büchlein war so etwas wie eine at the time, this little red book was like a political pass. You never went anywhere without it. It showed you were of a certain political persuasion. So it was also a sign. When the first mass meetings took place on Tiananmen Square with the Red Guards, Everybody waved their little book. So many young people who had come to the capital from the suburbs and the villages experienced it. The rallies were incredible. Newspapers reported on events as if Mao had appeared as a saint on Tiananmen Square. Mao watched the masses as they marched past and found his power intoxicating. Power does things to people, particularly because he was the overwhelming leader and most of his colleagues, I think, were not able to criticize and control him. There was no real collective leadership, they talked about it. He towered over the others. A decision that was adopted by the Central Committee of the Party, he could veto. So, in that kind of situation, I think a leader easily gets more and more full of pride and arrogant, and he doesn't think he needs to listen. Power corrupts. And by the time of the Cultural Revolution, he was already like a madman. With the fanatical masses behind him, Mao had secured a following which obeyed him unconditionally. He now used the power, given to him by the fear of the terror spread by the Red Guards, to dispose of party comrades who were critical of his dictatorial regime. <laughs> 
The In October 1966, the Cultural Revolution switched its objectives. From now on, its main focus was directed more and more against leaders within the party. So the movement was becoming increasingly opposed to party institutions. In this way, the fundamental organizational principles of the state were being questioned. Mao had deliberately made provisions for this. He was hoping that new forms of political organization might emerge, which would then enable him to keep the revolution going. Troublesome officials were arbitrarily accused of being revisionist, political thieves or spies. The witch hunt drove some party members to suicide. Many were arrested or disappeared without trace. Liu Shaoqi was also toppled and died in prison. It was some of the same leaders, but most of the original leaders were no longer there. More than a majority of the original Central Committee were overthrown. Of the original leaders, only ones left, besides Mao, were Zhou Enlai, Mao's secretary, Chen Bo Da, uh, Kang Sung, maybe one or two others. The rest were all gone. By October 1968, two-thirds of the Central Committee had fallen victim to the political purging. Mao had triumphed. Violence was common. It was about life or death. And Mao was absolutely ruthless, of course, when power was involved. He might not perhaps have been physically involved himself, but he did stir things up and let things run that led to violence. He was an out-and-out -out power seeker. He always knew which people to use to consolidate certain power structures and to back him and protect him. They included his wife, Jiang Qing, an ardent supporter of the Cultural Revolution. Mao had achieved his goal. The reformers had been neutralized, and he himself was again at the center of the action. The great chairman no longer needed his young pioneers. Many of his supporters were disappointed in Mao. I thought this was the most worthwhile thing possible. I did everything possible to support them. And I didn't realize, of course, that Mao was using them as a battering ram to overthrow his opposition. And when he found that he could not control the young people, he just sent them out to work in the villages, and, and that was the end of it. The party sent five million young people out into the provinces to work on the land together with several million cadres who were forced to work in rural regions. In this way, Mao solved two social problems with one move, that of the former Red Guards and their former victims. The program that involved sending Red Guards into the countryside began in late autumn 1968, and for many it even lasted until 1980. Basically, it meant that the mass phase of the Cultural Revolution was over. The Red Guards had served their mobilizing function. Mao was displeased that in no way had they managed to amalgamate and create new forms of political organization. Instead, they had mainly become involved in minor disputes. So he felt it was now time for the Red Guards to be re-educated through work on the land, to learn what revolution really meant. Thus, the Cultural Revolution, in a classical sense, was over. Although it was initially an urban phenomenon, the Cultural Revolution had also changed life radically for the peasants. First and foremost, they found the new arrivals to be a burden, a lost generation which characterizes China even today. People felt that they were building a better world, that Mao was against bureaucracy, against stagnation, against inequality between officials and ordinary people. And they were going to do away with all that. The students did away with the examinations. Who's not in favor of that? And um, of course, it ruined the educational system. 
for 10 years. And there's a whole generation, that whole generation that lost their education. The Cultural Revolution left behind a traumatized nation. Denunciation had become the most effective instrument of Mao's rule. Now, no one in China trusted anyone else. Everything was geared towards veneration of the great helmsman who continued to have himself celebrated with colossal parades. All Mao saw in his people was a mass to be guided and himself as the new emperor of China. He was openly saying that China needs an emperor figure and that of course was him. That to lead these, all these hundreds of millions of country people, they had to have a figure of imperial authority. Um, of course, in his mind, he associated this, his own power with carrying the revolution forward. He was going to liberate all mankind, but in fact, it was power. Meanwhile, tensions on China's border with the Soviet Union were threatening to escalate. In March 1969, an island in the Yusuri, a river that forms part of the Sino-Russian border, became a bone of contention between the two nuclear powers. There had already been repeated minor incidents there in the past. In the late 60s, Mao realistically saw the danger of a war with the Soviet Union. He'd already calculated that Russia might attack China with nuclear weapons. In fact, he'd already evacuated elements of the party leadership because he saw the threat as imminent. Mao tried to take the sting out of the conflict through rapprochement with the other superpower. After the collision on the border, which had been triggered by China, Moscow threatened to retaliate. Together with Alexei Kosygin, Chou Enlai managed to officially suppress the conflict, but tensions continued to smolder. Now the Chinese leadership began to turn to the other major nuclear power. Naturally, China's breach with the Soviet Union led to the Chinese thinking about a possible alternative ally to Moscow. They had certainly seen America as a counterweight to the Soviet Union and secondly, its huge economic potential which they wanted to make use of. Even today, Chinese communism is characterized not so much by clinging to dogmas as by the search for whatever can be useful to the country. The ideology is then altered a little to meet these requirements. Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Chou Enlai was just the right man for such a change of course. On April the 14th, 1971, this cosmopolitan figure gave the first press conference in Beijing to which foreign journalists were also invited. The occasion was a visit by the United States table tennis team. In the course of the discussions, the Chinese Premier adopted a surprisingly benevolent tone towards the US delegation. They have been cut off for a long time, but now, with your exception of the invitation extended, that we extended to you to come to China this time, we have opened a new page in the, his, in the relations of the Chinese and American people. And I am confident that this beginning, that this, uh, uh, beginning again of our friendship will, uh, between our two people will certainly meet with the approval and support of the great majority of our two people. I want to speak for the truth. The Premier was one of the most respected and popular politicians in China. Zhu Enlai was, if you like, always the good face of Chinese communism. This was partly because he was extremely charming and cosmopolitan and could move with great skill in diplomatic circles. He was also highly reliable and worked incredibly hard. If you look at his work diaries and see what he accomplished, you wonder when he ever slept. 
What tends to be forgotten is that Zhu actually participated in all of Mao's major political decisions and also implemented them responsibly in a wide variety of forms. In summer, Chou Enlai established contact with Henry Kissinger, the US president's security advisor. America was also looking for allies against the Soviet Union. Together, the two men agreed on a visit to Beijing by President Richard Nixon. When, in February 1972, he became the first US head of state to set foot on Chinese soil, it was Cho who received him, because Mao, the great chairman, now 78 years old, was seriously ill. At the time, Mao Zedong was in very poor health. Basically, it was a formal exchange which took place here, because the main talks were held between Zhu Enlai and Henry Kissinger. But even so, at least for the Chinese public, it was a difficult change of course to explain. The big upheavals which occurred in the early 70s in both foreign and domestic policy caused considerable doubt in the sincerity of the respective political lines and thus mistrust in the ideology as such. That also went a long way to preparing the way for what today we know as reform politics. Mao's wife, Chang Jing, was opposed to any type of reform. Nevertheless, in perfect publicity style, she received the leader of the West in her own environment, the Chinese opera. After Mao's death, she tried in vain to seize power as part of the so-called Gang of Four and reverse the reforms that had been introduced and prevent the country from opening up to the West. This rapprochement with the state's former number one enemy was also very hard to explain to the rest of the Chinese people. When I want a certain opening to promote technology and the economy, I also import ideologies. I need certain forms of behavior. This, of course, undoubtedly involves a great potential for conflict. But Mao had the skill and the strength, and he was needed for this. The pictures of Mao and Nixon went around the world. Thus, the Cold War with China was over. In autumn 1972, the People's Republic of China was recognized by the Federal Republic of Germany. When Federal German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt and his wife Loki paid their respects in 1975, Mao's doctors had already diagnosed an incurable nervous disease. Schmidt said later that he had met a wreck. His chin hung down, his mouth was open, his face was derelict. But even so, the ping-pong diplomacy between the United States and China produced some permanent successes. The aged dictator built up his influence abroad and, for instance, supported the terror regime of the Khmer Rouge. From 1974 75, Mao's health deteriorated rapidly. It's not that he handed over the reins of power. However, he had increasing difficulty making himself understood. In the end, it was only his nurse who could use sign language or some other form in order to make his utterances understandable. At times, Mao only expressed himself in written form. He would write short notes and in this way pass on any political instructions. But we can assume that before his death he was still politically awake and influential. So the reins of power were still in his hands. After three heart attacks, Mao Zedong passed away on September 9, 1976, at the age of 82. His body went on display in the Great Hall of the People. Thousands dutifully paid their final respects to the great helmsman. Because of poor embalming, Mao's corpse had shrunk. But at the funeral, neither his widow, Jiang Qing, nor the other loyal participants showed any reaction. Even in death, the great chairman remained untouchable. Even today, the Chinese Communist Party still reveres Mao Zedong as a great revolutionary 
philosopher and leading statesman, even though he was responsible for the deaths of an estimated 70 million people. His great sin was that after coming to power, I think he gradually became obsessed with power. And he launched these great social experiments like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution without having any idea of what was going to happen. He thought that he had the right to launch these experiments. And millions of people died as a result, tens of millions. It could well be that to a certain extent, the hysterical weeping at the funeral of the magnificent leader was arranged. For many Chinese, Mao Zedong's death was more of a liberation. But for many, it also meant the end of an era the end of a revolutionary who had made a new life possible for them. He embodies the success that China was united. He stands for the fact that people had bread and education, for the emancipation of women, and for a whole lot more. And for many, especially the older generation, he personally meant incredible progress. Bedeutet er einen unglaublichen Fortschritt. But this progress soon fell victim to Mao's megalomania. He had subjected China to 10 years of chaos. The great chairman had ruthlessly sacrificed an entire generation in order to defend his autocratic claim to power. The decade of terror still marks the country even today. And today too, critics in China are still silenced. Even today, the Cultural Revolution still characterizes China in many ways. Since there has never been any social discussion of exactly what happened, many of the old lines of conflict still exist. Amongst other things, for instance, there are powerful left-wing forces, some of whom are calling for a return to phases of the Cultural Revolution. Nor has there been any real study made of the perpetrators and victims of the time. We see this in totally practical matters, how simply political communication takes place, how dissidents are treated. All these things characterize Chinese society even today. No other communist leader, not even Stalin, stood as much at the center of a personal cult as the son of heaven Mao Zedong. Even today, he is present everywhere in the People's Republic of China. His portrait over the gate to the square of heavenly peace is seen as the hallmark of the country. And that is something even the millions of human lives the dictator cost will not change so quickly. <laughs>